Hey everyone, I am Charlie Shrem, and you are watching Untold Stories, listening to Untold Stories as well, where twice a week I get to talk to some of the coolest people in the crypto industry because I want to understand where we're going and to really understand where we're going and how we're going to get there and all the people and all the stories and everything along the way. I feel like we really need to understand where we came from to really also have some fun with this, you know, like have some fun with this industry and, and to and to really like make this exciting and, you know, talk about the rabbit hole and, to, and, and for all these different conversations and topics. So I'm so excited to have Pooja Shah, who leads a Filecoin project on the show today. Thank you so much for coming. Yeah, of course. Thank you so much for having me. Excited to be here. So um, I just want to give a little bit of, a, of an introduction to, to everyone about you. So you, you lead the, the Filecoin project. And for those who don't know, it's a crypto-powered decentralized storage network. And, and for those who do know, the, uh, I feel like the killer app for crypto is decentralized storage. And it's probably one of the reasons why it's so hard to do. I mean, it's so hard that doing decentralized file storage has been on TV shows like Silicon Valley. Like that's like, it's almost like, uh, but at the same time, you guys have, have been able to get to the point that you are today. So you're aiming to build this like robust and efficient foundation for tomorrow's internet. And uh, that's really exciting. Previously, you were the founder and the CEO of Dagny, a virtual reality company that built self-contained virtual reality headsets and fully immersive productivity applications. You began your career, and for everyone who knows, uh, you were working at uh, Palantir Technologies. Isn't that the bicycle or the mirror? One of them, right? The bicycle. No. The Sorry. <laughs> what, do you, what do you mean the bicycle? <laughs> the exercise bike. Is that what that is? Oh, no. Uh, that, so Palantir is a, it's essentially a, big data um, technology and consulting company. It works with lots of large institutions and government organizations in the world and tries to help use their data to solve problems that um, using their technology that otherwise would have been really, really hard to solve. It kind of um, came on the scene because of its work with the CIA and kind of um, volunteer technology was helped to, was used to help find Osama bin Laden um, back oh, wow. in the early 2000s. And yeah, so it's kind of this interesting secretive um, Silicon Valley company that recently went public this year. So <laughs> that's where I think uh, I was thinking of Plantar, which is an exercise thing. But uh, uh, uh -huh. I've I've heard of this. Uh, yeah. This is actually really cool. Uh, and there were uh, I think it wasn't it founded by Peter Thiel and a bunch of other people. Mm -hmm. Exactly. How can we talk about that a little bit? Like, how did that all come about? And what type of experiences did you learn there that mm -hmm. when you joined Filecoin and you joined crypto, you were like, oh, it's good I learned how to do that or how to deal with stuff like this. <laughs> yeah, definitely. So the company was founded, I think, in 2004. Um, so it's been around for quite a while. And in that, in that time has um, really it got, it began kind of getting um, into its niche with government organizations. So as I mentioned, the CIA was kind of the first customer and also an early investor in the company. And by the time I joined, which was um, about 10 years after that in 2012, I believe um, I first joined, you know, Palantir was now branching into a number of different areas, including commercial businesses. And um, so starting to work with groups like banks and insurance companies. What was companies. it founded to do? Well, it was, it was actually founded. So, you know, the, the founders had this really beautiful vision. Um, they used to call it emancipating intelligence. So there was kind of this idea that you could collect a bunch of data in the world, but really what we wanted from our data was the intelligence and the insights that came from being able to understand the connections and meaning between the various disparate pieces of data that lived across various, um, parts of our lives or of our organizations. So they basically thought that there was this power in, you know, if you take, if you look at a police department, for example, they may have each, each of their different divisions is like operates pretty independently, um, even today. And so, you know, the homicide department might use a different, um, database system and a system of record than the, um, like missing persons, uh, division or something like that. And what they, what they found was that actually, or what they believed initially was that if you were actually able to kind of take all of these disparate systems that are kind of related to each other, you can imagine you might want to share information between these like different departments super easily, because there may be people that you're interested in investigating who, um, would be relevant to both these sorts of cases or something, right? Like both missing persons and homicide potentially. Um, so they thought that if you could unite these, um, different 
sources of data under a common data ontology or a data schema, then you could see really interesting connections in the data that you wouldn't have been able to see otherwise. And that could really help um, humans speed up our investigations when we're trying to use data for that's re- various That's things. so cool. And is this for is this for only like government agencies or can can so is this essentially like commercializing intelligence? Was that what it was founded to do? Yeah, exactly. And they built some really powerful software to be able to do that um, really easily so that they could, you know, deploy it. Um, yeah, they, they took tried to take a productized solution to uh, I'm trying to remember, intelligence. But I yeah. think back in 2000, uh, back in like 2015 or 2016, mm-hmm. there was a, a, a rumor that, that you guys had owned like this huge quantum uh, Bitcoin mining service that was going to like take over Bitcoin mining or whatever. Uh huh. Oh, interesting. And, uh, yeah, there was a <laughs> yeah. whole. People can Google it. There was a whole like fear yeah. because that's now I'm thinking about it. Like everyone was thinking that there was this huge government body that was like commercializing intelligence that was kind of take over crypto or something like that. I'm just. But back in the den, back in the den, back in the day, we were just mm-hmm. hyper paranoid about everything. I mean, we all just till still hire lawyers to just help us sleep at night because we're still all hi- hyper paranoid and live with anxiety every day. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yep. Totally. <laughs> So what was your what was your progression? Did you did you know mm-hmm. about like Bitcoin and crypto when you were working there? Mm-hmm. Um, was that like a was there a transition? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So um, I did not really. I was I was roughly aware. Um, so again, I guess this is 2012, 2013. Um, I was roughly aware of the technology. Um, I had some friends from from college who had bought some Bitcoin and, you know, they had the actual physical tokens as well, I guess that was a yeah. thing back in the day. Um, so I had, I was kind of aware of that, but, um, I was not really aware of the implications, you know, if, if this technology was maybe implemented in different ways, like this just amazing Cambrian explosion really that has happened over the last few, like five or six years, um, in the crypto and web three space, I was not at all thinking about those sorts of implications. Um, but for me, you know, I, I went from Palantir. Um, I learned so much about just how organizations think about um, data. And I'd say that's probably the uniting theme from a lot of the experiences that I've had in, in my career. Um, I actually, after, after leaving Palantir, I um, briefly started this project uh, which we were calling the Better Brain Project. And the idea was to kind of replicate what Palantir was doing, but for individual um, people. So, you know, we also as individuals have all sorts of data in various different um, uh, venues, right? So we have our like social media accounts and our email and maybe even like written notes that we've taken and all of the documents that we've saved on our computer and so on. And um, we basically began this project to try to unite all of those different data sources and see what insights could emerge from that and how that could then be used. Um, you know, people, I don't know if you are familiar with some of these ideas about um, like personal CRMs and stuff that try to like take from your your text mm-hmm. messages and your email and everything and give you a record of like when you've talked to a particular person. So like like that, but on steroids for kind of every aspect of your life. Um, I became really interested in knowledge graphs. Like, you know, the Google knowledge graph was like just a really amazing technology at the time. Um, and I think all of this, like, you know, just thinking about networks of information and how people can leverage them in their lives is um, also that, like what led me to start uh, the virtual reality company. And I think there's a pretty important theme there that led me to be interested in, in working in this space now. So what is that theme though? Um, so <clears throat> I think, so, so with, um, there were, there were two themes, um, I think that I was really interested in exploring at the time. So one was this, this idea of like network of information, right. And what can that unleash for us if it's presented to people in a way that they can actually derive a lot of meaning from the other one was, um, about user interfaces. And I remember just thinking about how, you know, we saw this, this huge creative and productive explosion in our society when we went from command line interfaces to GUIs. And, um, when, when people started, you know, like, building virtual t- reality technology for real again in like the mid 2010s um that for me was just like okay personal computing now has this opportunity to see this shift from guis like 2d user interfaces to 3d user interfaces um as manifested in something like a virtual reality headset or an augmented reality headset that jump like though that. is mm-hmm. is is immense like it's that immense. J- yeah yeah it is immense but i think and, you know, there, we're still, it's been now, 
five you know, five, six years since people have, uh, since this like second or third wave of VR, right. Which was the one that started in the 2010s, people have tried, um, in the late 1990s. So, you know, and it, we still haven't, it still hasn't taken root because it is just so hard for people to make that jump. But I think there is just so much potential, um, in, in three, in just 3d UIs, especially for certain types of computing. If you think about like, you know, creative, creative applications and productivity applications, people like artists who are 3D modeling or maybe sculptors who want to envision what a piece of art looks like before they build it. Um, I think those interfaces are the most natural form for that sort of work. And I think that if we build that technology, we could see um, other people too, you know, like children in schools, right? Start to explore those um, creative skills that today they just don't really have a way to explore. Pooja, my my mother in law is like my best friend, right? And so yeah. we we joke her her nickname with her friends is faces because mm-hmm. she won't tell you how she's feeling sometimes, but she'll make these faces where she's wearing her emotion and her thoughts on her face. And uh-huh. then when we so she manages our vacation rental business, mm-hmm. and when I need to talk to her to get her thoughts and opinions and ideas to collaborate with her because she has a, the best ideas, I have to do it in person because. I can't see her face or hear her voice when I'm on the phone. I can, you know, on the phone or whatever. Yeah. Why am I telling you this? Reason is, is when COVID hit, COVID hit, when this, when we transitioned or accelerated into this like hyper work from home world, mm-hmm. in the back of my head, ever all these companies were touting working from home is great. Google, Uber, you know, you'll never need to come to the office again. It's the end of the office as we know it. Mm-hmm. And in the back of my head, I'm saying, I don't believe that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I still don't believe that. And now, just the other day, I saw an article that they did a statistic at Google and they said that you can't work as well. Your, your efficiency as a developer working from home is like single digit percentages versus if you're working from an office. But And so why is anyone surprised that when you have people that, yeah, you can collaborate on things like Slack and, and they're you face to face and you could be. I work for a company that I was COO and I was having to be Zoom like in their main TV screen in the office from nine to five every day. Like Mm -hmm. you can see me, right? I hated that. Why am I telling you this? What's the point? The point is that with VR, I thought you would see a huge acceleration in its adoption because with VR, you can have like virtual offices where it's comfortable. Why didn't that happen? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's a really, really great question. I I do think um, the space still hasn't found its killer app. Basically, I think there were a lot of hypotheses. I think that was a very strong hypothesis that um, you know, I remember this company, I think it was called Envelope VR or something like that, or Envelope VR. Envelope and VR, I think I heard of it too. You remember, yeah. And I own all the Oculuses, so I'm a big oh, yeah. VR lover. Yeah. Totally. I have the first I have the first one I bought on Indiegogo. I think it was yeah. Indiegogo. Yeah, like it's a collector's item. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It still makes yeah. me sick when I look at it because you get throw up the first time you'd use it. Exactly. And I, I think that's a big part of the reason why it hasn't really clicked yet. Um, I, th- I think my current my current hypotheses for why it hasn't quite taken off yet um, are involve two components. One is that I think the technology, in order for it to actually feel comfortable for people to use for long periods of time, is still not there. Um, you know, people still people can't feel sick uh, after using it for like 20, 30 minutes, which I think is the case still for a lot of people. Um, and so that requires just these like incredibly sensitive um, sensors that the devices are using to kind of match the digital display to what your like actual body experience is. It needs so, to emit THC to pr- yeah. remove the nausea <laughs> as it's as you're wearing it. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then the other is also just finding what that killer application is and, you know, where is it really going to start to take root? Um, I think we saw a lot of interest in VR from the gaming community. And uh, I think there still are some people who are just like diehard um, VR enthusiasts because they're the games that they love are just like 100 times better in VR. But that's a great point. Do you think yeah. that the VR industry was like almost typecasted into the gaming world? like an actor can get typecasted into a specific role. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Very I, interesting I, theory. I do think so. Yeah. Um, so then a lot of money went towards like developing it for gaming. Whereas now that we're, we're communicating about this, mm-hmm. you could have gotten to a, to a, to a, like a product ready mm-hmm. 
uh, if their money was there and being towards that, you could have gotten faster to a product ready virtual office before you have a product ready virtual video gaming system where you're moving your head and you're shooting guns and you're, or mm -hmm. you're playing tennis where you're gonna get sick anyways when you play real life tennis. <laughs> yeah. So you know what I mean? <laughs> yep, totally. Uh, Okay, yeah. so I want to transition a little bit here. Sure. Uh, and so you're obviously, here you are, you're your first to, uh, it's safe to say that you've decided to to work in the most complicated, like, industries where you cannot even see the light at the end of the tunnel. Mm -hmm. You just got to like going and going. And it sounds like that's what you like to do. You just like to experiment without knowing mm -hmm. what the result will be. Is that is that a fair, like, assessment of you? I think that that is true. I love I love challenging myself just to see, you know, how far I can push myself and what I am capable of overcoming in general. But I think my interest, at least in currently in, in crypto and Web3, uh, comes from something a little bit more fundamental, just in terms of like what I, what I have over my life um, come to believe is really important, which has to do with um, actually, actually, you know, a lot of it stems from the same themes that we were talking about before and how... Um, I think about, you know, 3D user interfaces and virtual reality and what that looks like if you extrapolate in maybe 20 years, um, hopefully at least, maybe it's sooner, maybe it's a little bit later, and it starts to include things like brain computer interfaces, which I think are some of, you know, it's like the furthest extrapolation today that most people think of when they think about 3D user interfaces. Um, and how when we live in that world that has brain computer interfaces, which are digital devices that are capturing some of our most intimate personal informa information. Yeah, like my whoop like or whatever. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, and just like something like that, that's just monitoring your brain and your neural activity all the time. And it's able to understand what you're thinking and, you know, how you're feeling about things. That's sort of like incredibly personal information. Um, I don't think we want to live in that world without systems that give users and like individual people full control over their data, the ability to say, you know, who they want to have access to their data and when and why, um, and the ability to revoke that access really granularly as needed. Like maybe you can see my emotion uh, in like this minute from yesterday, but like nothing beyond that, you know, I think, I think that level of control over our data, um, while being able to leverage the insights from it, um, so like you, we still are going to want to have like the analyses on our Collective. personal information. Yeah, exactly. Like it's like the, the smart thermometer that everyone can take their temperature and then it creates like a, like a heat map of everyone's temperatures around the country. Yeah, exactly. But it's like de-anonymized. Right. And so, but like, if we want to use our information for our own analyses and like understand how we stand in relation to the populace, we're still going to want to be able to do that. And so I think in that future, we need the sort of technology that our industry is building today. Like we need decentralized storage networks and we need homomorphic encryption and like, you know, privacy oriented cryptographic primitives in general. I'm really happy that you're saying all this because uh, all these industries that were gonna, gonna come like uh, the ability to, to do what you're talking about, like have all this data in real time and our brain data mm -hmm. without the advent of this blockchain technology, mm -hmm. it would go towards the route of very centralized where you then have to trust that centralized centralized company to be to have integrity, which is which is not mm -hmm. a bad thing per se. Like I trust mm -hmm. a lot of companies with their integrity. We all do. That's how business works. But yeah. if you can have their ability to remove that uh, that that need for the trust, and then the companies don't have to like be focusing on on that on the transparency and then the regulations that will come out that protect personal freedoms, especially in this country. Mm -hmm. uh, so my question to you really is, when did you realize that personal liberties needed to be uh, like like so firmly held? Because, you know, you did start your career in like a very centralized intelligence company. Yes, totally. Yeah. And I think that that is, is part of where it started, actually. You know, like I think um, Palantir is, is like such an amazing company. I really don't have anything, you know, negative to say about it. Um, I'm still very much in touch with a lot of people that I worked with there and have a huge amount of respect for them. But I think some of these ideas about centralization and the power of knowledge, right? Like this motto of wanting to emancipate intelligence. I mean, data is so powerful. And, and as our society has increasingly cared about technologies like AI, this has only just become more true, where literally companies are acquired for hundreds of millions of dollars today because of the data that they've been able to capture. And it's not even like personal information that could be used for advertising and targeting purposes. Um, so I think I, I started to, uh, I, I had that experience 
Um, and I think these things just kind of merged in, in a really natural way. Once I started to think about, you know, what does this future look like when we extrapolate 3D user interfaces, when we stra- extrapolate our super data oriented society to like 20 or 30 years from now? And how do we protect ourselves in that digital We won't future? need our bodies anymore though. And I've been talking about sportsbet.io and their clubhouse, which is a huge community. When you play, when you make a bet, when you do a spin, they pay you with free hands, cash back and bets. You can play all sorts of games and they've been doing this for so long in a free, fair and transparent way on the blockchain. Well, that's not why I'm excited today and why I'm talking to you about this. Because now they're taking this community to the next level by sponsoring the Southampton Football Club. You're talking about millions of British football fans can now see the Bitcoin logo on the front and the sleeve of also the Walford Football Club. I mean, how amazing is that? You're talking about not sponsoring your company. You're talking about sponsoring Bitcoin and crypto. Millions of people around the world are now going to be seeing this and joining the sportsbet.io clubhouse to earn more points, to play games, and to be part of that community. There's really no other way that you can use and spend your crypto and then actually earn more back and be part of this whole community. So listen, make sure you guys join sportsbet.io forward slash podcast. Give them the support that they deserve because they're supporting us and me. Go play some games, get some free hands, get some free spins, and make sure you check them out and support them on the Southampton Football Club's first game. Whenever that's going to be, check it out. It's a crazy world when I tell you that everything we say, do, hear, see, sleep, everything that we uh, interact with the world is being constantly listened to, packaged up, and sold to other people without our permission. But we already know that. Don't you? You're you're not in your head. We know that. Why are we okay with it? We shouldn't be. We're not getting paid for any of that. Well, my sponsor, Permission.io, actually a very cool company, and you could check them out at Permission.io forward slash Charlie. They figured out a way for you to get a piece of the action because advertisers are going to be targeting you no matter what, and now you can decide which advertisers are able to do so by granting them specific permission and then you get a piece of the action. So you're like basically earning rewards for doing what you already do online, consuming the content and sharing all your favorite information. Now, right at this minute, only these tech giants are profiting from your data. You have all these like uh, Cambridge Analytica and all these like uh, crazy files that are coming out with how our data is being used against us to spin elections and fake news and blah, blah, blah. With my sponsor, Permission.io, that is about to change. If anything, check it out. It's so cool what they're doing and how they're doing it. You can get a special sneak peek at Permission.io forward slash Charlie. And thank you guys. Thank you, Permission team, so much for sponsoring and allowing me to do what I love to do and to do this show. So you've been listening to the show. You're ready to dabble in DeFi. You're ready to buy and sell some coins and tokens. But you go on some unknown exchange and you find out that you can't actually deposit or withdraw or trade any of these coins or tokens because you need gas. You need trading fees. You want to trade this coin or token. You need Ethereum gas. You want to trade this other one. You need NEO. You need Polkadot. You need IOTA or whatever you choose. You just need all this stuff. Well, my sponsor, Bittrex Global has decided from now until the end of the year, they will not give you any trading fees or any gas fees for any of those DeFi coins or tokens. This is not some unknown exchange. This is Bittrex Global. They are a true OG. I've been trading with them since 2014. They are, they pride themselves on being the safest, most secure exchange. How do you get all these no no fees and no trading fees and no exchange fees and no and no DeFi fees? You gotta go on untoldstories.com forward slash Bittrex Global. That's untoldstories.com forward slash Bittrex Global. They are so cool. The company has been around for so long. They were the first company back then to have faces or names on their website. Uh, They were so transparent. They still are. It's very important to have a company in our space that's been around for as long as they are. So you feel safe and secure. But they're not being complacent. They're growing. Bittrex Global is offering no gas fees no trading fees only to untold stories listeners this is an edge for you you go to untoldstories.com forward slash bitrex global what's the what's the downside i mean you're just trading the same thing you're trading on other exchanges but you're getting no fees and you don't have to worry about gas it's like gonna save you thousands of dollars in the long run untoldstories.com forward slash bitrex global enjoy if do you watch the show upload did you watch that show I haven't, no oh you would be all over that because oh, nice. it's exactly yeah. what you're talking about the end game not yeah. the end game, but the end result 
mm-hmm. is to upload your brain into mm-hmm. this digital world. So you do die, but your brain keeps on living. Wow. And oh, it's crazy though. So yeah. you ready for the, like, I don't want to ruin the story, the, the show for people, <laughs> but I'll say this one thing. So like the first people that were uploaded in the first week, they all killed themselves because in the, in the, in the virtual reality, because wow. the coders of the virtual reality world that you'd go to when you die, they didn't put in, they thought that people wouldn't want to have to go to the bathroom. Mm -hmm. But when you remove that human aspect of going to the bathroom, Mm -hmm. people didn't know what to do with themselves. Like it, (laughs) and after a week, it was a mass suicide because- But but see, the thing is like, okay, what happens in real life when we're we're faced with these like extreme challenges that force us to live totally differently? We adapt. Um, We adapt, yeah. Like what's Mm -hmm. happening right now, you know? I mean, I think the the progression to those sorts of things will be slow enough that we'll learn how to cope um, along the way. I don't, I don't think it's going to be one day we live as we live now, and then the next day, like a, a switch will flip. And, and that's what we'll I say there. to myself to sleep at night every yeah. night. I say what you just said, and <laughs> right. it's true though. No, it's very true. Yeah. So de- decentralized storage has such a a fundamental. Uh, Sorry, let me let me let me rephrase that question. Decentralized storage, when it reaches mass mass adoption and mainstream, will have such a fundamental uh, effect on like how the world works because it just won't it won't just make. Mm-hmm. And I want you to explain to everyone like on the outset, it won't just make storage cheaper and easier to use, but it'll also remove v- uh, uh, various governments' ability mm-hmm. around the world to control uh, that information that they've been controlling up until now. And everyone knows that you control the financial world and you control information and you control the people who live within those borders. Mm-hmm. Uh, is that like kind of your your personal ethos? Yeah, I think that that is one, um, that's one aspect of it. I, I think there are a few reasons I, I am super inspired to work on decentralized storage technology. I do think that that is one reason for it. Although, you know, in order for these systems to even survive um, today as they're getting started and they haven't yet, um, you know, actually like the Filecoin network is starting to become really significant, but um, it's still got a long way to go. And um, in order to survive in these early days, we need to make sure that what we're building works within the existing structures of society, right? Like I think um, painting a big target on the back of the project is something that would likely cause it to come under, a, you know, just uh, its existential risk to the project um, in a number of ways. So we're doing a lot of things to make sure that at least for Filecoin, um, we're allowing, we're, we're creating a fundamentally decentralized system and it's not opinionated about, you know, censorship resistance or, you know, government regulation or anything like that. It's just the fundamental decentralized storage infrastructure layer. Um, but there are, you know, like little features and plugins and um, capabilities, second layer solutions on top of the core network that allow people to opt in to those systems. Like, you know, if you uh, if you don't want to be storing a particular kind of data, you can decide to you do can that. Choose. And, yeah, exactly. You um, can have like church run you know, data centers that are that are mining file coins so they can then mm-hmm. uh, uh, host data that may choose to to only host like, you know, biblical text or whatever, because exactly. there's a finite amount of, of data there and that's in their right. Exactly. exactly. Hey, this may be a stupid question, but like mm-hmm. when I was younger, I would, you know, dabble with BitTorrent and LimeWire and everything. And the basic understanding of BitTorrent is that it's like decentralized file storage, right? Like you're mm-hmm. downloading something and pieces of all from a lot of different people. Why why doesn't that technology work here? Yeah, well, so actually a lot of the um, fun, like the underlying principles behind a network like Filecoin are very similar to a network like BitTorrent. So um, the design of BitTorrent and a couple of other uh, peer-to-peer file uh, storage sy- systems um, influenced IPFS, which is another protocol and project that is maintained by Protocol Labs. Um, the company that you know file, that also um, maintains the Filecoin project right now in conjunction with the Filecoin Foundation and a number of other community groups. So um, IPFS was really you know learned a lot from the lessons of um, of BitTorrent. A lot of like the core technologies like content addressing and things like that come from um, from these systems. And Filecoin um, builds on IPFS. You know, it uses like IPFS technology, and so. It actually does have a lot of the fundamental mechanics of BitTorrent sort of embedded within the Filecoin network. The key difference is that Filecoin has 
um, these economic incentives so that people, you, whereas in a system like BitTorrent, um, people are sort of participating almost altruistically. You know, it's like while their, their computer is online, they're participating in this, in this network, but otherwise you just don't really know, like, you know, there's no guarantee, there's no strong guarantees in the system and Filecoin's economic incentives allow you to have more of those storage guarantees. So Filecoin is like the economic, uh, and social incentive, uh, next level of Mm -hmm. IPFS where IPFS was, was like, uh, is it fair to say it's a protocol? And tell me if I'm wrong. Is mm-hmm. I remember when when Wikipedia started being uh, blocked in a lot of places, they used this technology to allow people to mirror Wikipedia locally. Is that accurate? Yes, that's accurate. Oh, awesome. So that I love awesome. when I bring all these things together. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, so this may be another stupid question. Why isn't IPFS enough? Mm-hmm. Well, it's for the same reason. IPFS is actually, um, you know, a really incredible technology. It's used by so many people actually in the crypto space, as I'm sure you know. Yeah, of course. Know. Yeah. Um, so it's a mainstream technology at this point. It is, yeah. Um, yeah, and, and IPFS is, you know, really um, meets the needs. Like, so, and just to clarify, you know, when we talk, so we think of Filecoin also as um, IPFS. It's like part of the IPFS Yeah, it's part ecosystem. of the thing. Yeah, exactly. Um, but there are, you know, also two separate like public networks that kind of do some, some mechanisms like content discovery and things like that slightly differently, um, at least today. So, but the reason we decided to build Filecoin was that, um, essentially what I was mentioning before, where, because IPFS doesn't have incentives baked into it, economic incentives baked into it, um, unless you as a user are, um, paying some service and, over the years, there have been services that have come up to fill this like niche, right? Or this, this like missing piece of the solution. But unless you're, you're doing something to kind of, um, like we call it pinning, pin, pin and maintain your data. There's a chance that, you know, maybe, maybe the nodes on the network that are storing your data will go offline. And then it's like not currently accessible for them from the network or, um, you know, the nodes may garbage collect their data stores and then that data is no longer accessible. So it's much more like altruistic. Um, and the services that emerge to kind of fill this gap over the last few years, they're really, really important, really powerful. Um, but they're, they're today, they're mostly using centralized, um, centralized solutions to store this data. Yeah, they do. It ends yeah. up becoming like a permission system. So like, yeah. uh, my friend was one of the founders of storage back in like 2012. Okay. Yeah. Um, and that, you know, like people don't realize like one of the first smart contractual or like non-finance related crypto projects was this, was storage or storage mm-hmm. or whatever you want to say. But it's been like a very big uphill battle to do, to do this decentralized storage. Yeah. And so the difference here is that you've done this like hybrid proof of stake model mm-hmm. where instead of separating the miners and the nodes and like, like, so someone like me can come and say like, Hey, I want to open up my storage and then like my computer here and be storage, mm-hmm. I actually have to be mining, mine, every time I hit the table, I'm testing one to do, do the, test, there we go. Yeah. Every time I, uh, so when I'm, so I have to be mining Filecoin in order to be, in, 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 uh, in order to be actually uh, being a member of the uh, storage network. Why mm-hmm. go that route? Like, so, you know, mm-hmm. we were talking earlier before the show how like, countries and companies and like how countries and federal reserve banks and central banks have these, you know, governors who have went to school for all these years and have all these experience, you know, pulling the levers of these economies here. Now companies, when they start up, have to have these like same type of off, you know, divisions within them that manage their token economies. And we don't really know what are what we're doing, which is, which is fun for me at least. Uh, but, um, <laughs> Why go that route? Like, so how did you guys come up with, with your whole economic structure? Cause mm-hmm. I ask p- people want to listen because they're interested, but I ask because like, I think token economics is the coolest thing ever. And it's probably what keeps me in this industry till today. Yeah. Yeah, totally. It's so incredibly fascinating and you're so right. I mean, I think we recently, um, a few months ago, we were reflecting on the investment that we've made, just the effort that we put into our, the Filecoin economy. and it is, I think it, it rivals the investment that some of the, you know, like medium sized nation states, they probably make into, yeah, um, crazy. <laughs> yeah, into understanding their own macroeconomics. So, yeah, I mean, I think this, um, there are a couple of things that do make Filecoin extremely unique. Um, definitely the crypto economy and also the unique 
uh, proofs that we use on the, the network, which you kind of alluded to when you're talking about the hybrid um, proof of stake model. And so for both of these efforts, um, there has been a huge investment kind of in, you know, really just honestly spinning up research labs within, um, within the project that are focused on thinking through some of the fundamental questions about um, these technologies. How does the system work? How do these components work with each other? And um, developing simulations to understand how these, um, especially on the economic side, how the economy will, will perform under extreme load at like massive, massive scale um, to give us confidence in the way that we were designing some of the mechanisms of the system and also some of the actual parameters that we were choosing. So, um, you know, it's been for both of these things, uh, you know, we, we like to talk about how building Filecoin was like building a software rocket because, uh, and I think this is true for every crypto network, you know, it's like you get one chance at a launch. Um, if it goes badly, you can't really, uh, course correct that easily. So we needed it to be extremely robust, extremely secure. And, um, all of these systems, which are in, in, in and of themselves, extremely complicated, but even more important was like, how do these systems relate with each other? How do the proofs relate with the mining mechanics? Um, how do they relate with the economics of the system? Um, how do like they relate with storage demand and what we're expecting to see from users and, and all of these components of the system, um, we, we spent, you know, like the better part of the last uh, year and or year and a half, really investigating and de uh, developing the technology to understand how the system works at scale. Well, you so, said you, you said like when a rocket ship launches, you know, you only have one chance. But I just watched the SpaceX rocket go off last week. Yeah. Uh, and what I learned is that there are so many redundancies and fixes where the mm -hmm. AI, you know, hats off to Elon Musk, can fix itself. And in fact, as the rocket was going off, there was an issue with... Um, with the hatch leaking, with mm. the propellant leaking. There was like a bunch of it as it was going up, like stuff that caused the Challenger to explode. Mm -hmm. Why am I telling you all this? Mm -hmm. Of course, I always try to bring it all back. Mm -hmm. When Filecoin launched, there was like uh, an economic kind of like, not issue, but there was, you know, there was a lot of news during your launch. And and tell me if I understand this correctly, what happened. But essentially, um, there you have three types of miners. And to be a storage miner, you have to uh, hold Filecoin. And at launch, there wasn't enough Filecoin to go around to miners. So they had to buy it on the market and then they had to, the price went up and then they ended up borrowing it from people at these like crazy interest rates. So, the, but everything corrected itself. Mm -hmm. So my question to you is, what type of redundancies did you put in place before? Like what type of scenarios or war games did you think of where you'd have to fix these things? And then when this was actually happening, this could have been a huge detriment to Filecoin. What mm -hmm. was going on internally? How did you guys solve all these things? And, and where are you today? Mm -hmm. Yeah, great question. Yeah, so there were a few things that we... Um, you know, th there were definitely a lot of things that we predicted in advance of the, of the launch and mitigated... Um, as much as we we could, or, and we we had strong confidence to believe that it would be sufficient. Um, and then the other thing was just thinking about how do we be really responsive. So, um, so, so in the first category, you know, we um, actually the, the period before the actual Filecoin launch was a period that we called Space Race. It was kind of this um, competition for miners to just you know, like with our support, start onboarding their storage capacity to the network. Um, and when that competition ended, we basically supported every miner that had participated in that competition um, with directly onboarding them onto the mainnet at the capacity that they had committed yeah. during the testnet period. So, um, you know, so that with was their own software, like with their own hardware, right? Like they, did they need their own hardware, hardware to mine Filecoin? Yes. Okay. Yes, they did. Like yeah. ASICs? Are they like ASICs essentially? Um, we haven't seen ASICs yet. It's, it's, you know, we're, we worked really hard to make the um, our proofs constructions uh, be able to run like very competitive competitively on commodity hardware. Well, and can, so, can this yeah. hardware be used for any other thing? I guess was my question. Or is this like is it a paperweight if it's not mining? FIL? No, yeah, it is. It's just you know, it's like GPUs and okay. um, hard disk, basically. Yeah. So it can be used for other things. Um, and so that was one thing that we that we knew we wanted to have um, like it was just important for the network to have um, significant capacity at launch, which we, we, I think have definitely succeeded against that goal. The network's now it's, we've launched a month ago, I guess, and the network now um, recently surpassed an exabyte. Um, it may have. Wow. Been, yeah. So it's, That's unbelievable. it's huge. Yeah. And so, um, and so like, you know, by supporting miners who were like early um, 
community members yeah. and who really cared about the long-term health of the network. We helped them with that transition to mainnet. Um, and then the other thing that we really invested in was <clears throat> making sure that, you know, as you were saying, like during the launch, right, of, of the SpaceX rocket, um, this, the, the software that was monitoring the actual rocket, like had to be really robust and identify when things seemed kind of out of line. And so we invested heavily in developing systems like that too, that would help us like understand what was going on with, um, the community and the market and so that we could immediately identify these issues. And, um, so we had like really, you know, powerful co- monitoring software and, um, wanted to be able to be responsive to the things that were arising. And so, um, the situation correcting itself was because, you know, like these loan markets, um, we noticed that this was like um, something that we needed really quickly. And so Protocol Labs also spun up kind of like a, a minor loan program as, as well as like other I, I saw that. I saw yeah. that. And that was kind of uh, awesome because you were adapting mm-hmm. to what the market was doing instead of trying to change the market from trying to do what it's doing. You have to let mm-hmm. these like markets play out because they're not efficient. Mm-hmm. They're only efficient when we allow them to be. And humans, we want instant gratification. We want things to work now. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, that's, it's essentially how it all played out. And it was, I was excited to talk to you because, mm-hmm. uh, it was not fun to watch cause I was not like an investor or anything, but it was fun to kind of yeah. see how everything would, would play out because mm-hmm. when decentralized, so everyone talks about how Bitcoin and crypto will reach mass adoption when mm-hmm. we're using it without even knowing that we're using it. This mm-hmm. is that, yes. that, this is that right there. Totally, totally. Yeah. And that's the thing I'm honestly the most excited about. I mean, there are a couple of, um, we uh, didn't get a chance to talk about this earlier about like when we were saying, you know, decentralized storage is not just cheaper and easier to use in in a lot of ways. Um, but it also just enables these really unique things to exist in the world that couldn't have exist before existed before. Um, and so I think those sorts of things, once we start seeing that and, um, you know, like one, one example, we like to call this, uh, this idea of verifiable storage. And it's really just this, like one of the core features of Filecoin is that when you store data to the network, um, the content identifier, right, up for that particular piece of data, like the fingerprint for the data that you're storing on the network gets published on chain as well. And, um, and what that enables is like anytime, it's kind of a way, I think of it as a way to actually fight misinformation um, because if you think about it, like, you know, you can store something on the Filecoin network and it, it, because the record, like that unique fingerprint is stored into the blockchain at a particular moment in time. If a few days later or a m- few months later, someone tries to present an alternative version of that same document that like looks very similar on mm-hmm. its face, but, you know, has altered a few things, um, its fingerprint will be different. And people can compare these things like on the Filecoin blockchain and say, well, no, like this, this other document was actually stored like several months before. And this is kind of the original thing, right? Um, and I think that sort of uh, functionality, which like really didn't exist before, couldn't really exist before we had this idea of like storage proofs um, that anyone in the world can verify that are based on the unique fingerprint of a piece of data, um, which is unique to Filecoin, right? Like that sort of thing, we've already started seeing how that can become uh, really powerful with certain certain groups that have started to use Filecoin, um, like nonprofit organizations that are storing um, cultural archives on the network and things like that. So I'm really excited to see that vision take off and um, see how people are using Filecoin for those use cases. And it doesn't even matter that it's Filecoin under the hood. What matters is that they're using this like uniquely enabling technology that like couldn't have that didn't exist before. This technology we need to make sure stays in the hands of the individual and so i'm gonna like end off Mm -hmm. with this because i'm a big uh as i as we we continue to live in the space and as the space continues to grow i find myself being a little bit more critical and so i i always try to make sure that um if i can say things or influence people in any way i would want to influence and push for the most permissionless systems possible and so one of my fears with, with, point, with proof of stake has always been, and I tell this to the founders, you know, the creators and everything, uh, is that proof of stake is not as permissionless as proof of work is. And because as long as no one owns all the resources in the world, proof of work will never, you'll never need permission to join that network. The problem with proof of stake is you need, and I'm not talking about Filecoin, I'm talking about proof of stake yeah. first. The proof of stake you need and this is Ethereum, this is everything. Well, not Ethereum yet, but down the road when it moves to proof of stake. Uh, any blockchain that is on proof of stake, 
you know, as it reaches scale, the 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 stakeholders that hold the most of it are not going to want other stakeholders to be involved. So obviously, they can manipulate the price on the markets and manipulate the supply to prevent other people from coming in. Now, other people can eventually pay and come in, but I'm talking about people who live in places that don't have money who want to participate on the network. So my ask of you mm-hmm. is to keep this as permissionless as possible. I'm talking about like the ability to mine it, the ability to get Filecoin, the ability to get the hardware, please, because this technology is amazing. And I don't want to see down the road uh, permissioned blockchains where you need permission to join them and to leave them. That's like my ask of you. 100%. And I'm so glad you mentioned that. And um, I share the same vision, though I know the team, like everyone on the team shares the same vision. Um, Filecoin, the the goal um, is for anyone in the world, like if you have a computer, you can participate in the Filecoin consensus process and you can awesome. mine Filecoin, you know? So um, definitely agree. Uh, we all should keep that in mind, um, moving away from permissioned blockchains into a, a truly permissionless future. Totally moving agree. away from a permissioned world too, yeah. because it's not yeah. about people are like, well, why don't you want to trust people? Isn't the whole, isn't, aren't relationships built on trust? And I said, yes, but imagine if you didn't have, imagine how many friendships you would still have if you didn't have to trust your friend when it came to like borrowing money. Imagine mm-hmm. if, imagine if like, the relationships that you'd have with people that didn't get soured by finances or something business related, if you could like remove the, but at the end of the day, you can't avoid those things. Sometimes, you know, you're going to travel with your friends on a vacation and you're going to need to split the trip. But, and imagine if you didn't a world where you didn't need to have trust when it comes to, when it comes to information and finance in the financial world, that's like a beautiful world and we can get back to like being social with each other and getting back to like loving and living. That's like, my end off of the show. Thank you so much for coming today. Thank you so much. This This was awesome. I I love it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. (laughs) 